Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. We're very happy to have you with us this afternoon for the CAFE presentations. Uh, I know a lot of you in this room, but for those of you I have not yet had the pleasure of meeting, uh, my name is Susan McTiernan, and I have the great pleasure of serving as Dean of the Gabelli School of Business. I also have the great pleasure this afternoon of introducing our President, Dr. Donald Farish, who's going to offer a couple of words of welcome of his own. Dr. Farish. <laughs> So the first thing we need to do is blow out the black back wall of this room and make it about 50% uh, larger because this is getting to be a very uh, crowded space with these events. And, and I was just thinking, you know, in, in football games, uh, the, right down to the very end of the game and there's a team that's going to kick a field goal that will win the game and the opposing coach calls a timeout to ice the kicker. And my job today is I'm icing this team of people. They're ready to go. And I am standing between them and they're ready and getting started. So I'm going to do this pretty quickly. I want to, first of all, uh, once again, congratulate and commend uh, Professor Michael Melton, who invented this whole idea. I mean, he's been, he's been doc for these, this team of students for certainly as, as long as I've been here. And one of my fun events is to come to these events twice a year to listen to the team talk about how they've done with their investments. And the reason why this is important is that they're not playing with matchsticks. They're, they have real money to invest, and, and they have to account for the fact that they either made a lot of money, in which case we really congratulate them, and I actually do turn over my personal retirement fund for them, but, or they lose money because the market's been tough that year. And they hold themselves up and accountable to other programs that are similarly doing similar kind of work around the country. And very, very often, we find that the team has done at least as well as everyone in the last two years ago. I think we won two of these major competitions. So th th these, these students, historically, have been as good as any in the country in, in making sound investments. And given the nature of what they are studying, this is perfect for beginning to understand, not just in theory, but in practice, what the world of finance and investment is all about. And in that sense, uh, Michael's, having started this program, anticipated uh, in a very meaningful way the work that we're trying to do all across campus right now, which is to prepare people for the world they're going to enter once they graduate by giving them relevant experience to their major while they're here. And we're doing this so in such a broad-mannered fashion right now that we, this year, said, okay, we're going to guarantee that every student coming to Roger Williams will have the opportunity to do at least one of these what we call project-based learning experiences. And they vary a lot depending on the major and the nature of the program. Some of them are embedded in the campus community. Uh, some like this are working right here on the campus but with these strategies involved behind effective investing. This is a very well educated group of young people standing behind me. I know that because all of their antecedents have been very well trained. And Michael is not going to let the quality uh, fall. So I'm really setting the bar of expectation very high, uh, just in case they weren't nervous enough. Um, and I'm looking forward to a really elegant presentation, and, and particularly the Q&A session that follows, because um, they can rehearse just so far. But they're at their very best when they're answering questions on the fly that come from the audience. So start thinking up some good questions. Put these people <laughs> through their paces. And all of the veterans of past Cafe presentations. Welcome back, guys. Good to see you. And, uh, and now. And I think I see some proud parents in here as well. So I'm going to turn these people loose now that they're at the highest possible level of anxiety, and we'll, we'll uh, look forward to a great afternoon. Thanks for being here. All right, thank you, President Farish. Um, I'd like to start by saying good afternoon and welcome everyone to the 2015 Fall Cafe final presentation. We'd like to thank all you parents and family members, former cafe, cafe fans, whatever it may be, um, for coming today because we wouldn't be able to do this presentation uh, without you guys. So uh, to begin the presentation, I'd like to introduce everyone, everyone here from the cafe. We have our program director, Dr. Michael Melton, who we call Doc, standing in the back of the room. Each semester, Doc selects 10 to 12 students who he trains as analysts, and these analysts are responsible for the management of two real dollar portfolios. Those analysts are standing here in front of you today. 
Um, I'd like to introduce the ones to my left. We have Rachel Batista, Jonah Schwartz, Kelly Fitzpatrick, Ryan Corey, Nicholas Fontaine. To my right, we have Dave Buiz, Shannon Squire, Brian Flanagan, Jake Wazarko, and Megan Alby. Conducting is Robert Blyer. Next to me is Zach Gearing. My name is Eric Gilmet, and together we are the Associate Directors for the Cafe. Before we begin this presentation, I'd like to give special thanks to Hans Christensen at MJX Asset Management, Recon Capital Partners, and our advisory board that sits before you today. So the students will be presenting the portfolio methodology for our Student Investment Management Fund, and to begin the presentation, I'd like to call up Rachel and David. Thank you, Eric. So as you all know, this hasn't exactly been the easiest year for investing. It's important for you to know that unfortunately, year to date, we have underperformed the market. However, since this group of student fund managers reallocated, we have outperformed the market on both a raw and risk adjusted basis. We will later discuss the reasons behind our fund's underperformance, but until then, it is extremely important that we explain to you our process and explain how what has happened in the past is not nearly as important as how we've uh, set up our fund to perform in the future. As Eric said, we manage two real dollar portfolios one with an objective of large cap domestic value, and the other with the objective of large cap domestic blend. The blend portfolio we are preparing for you today encountered many changes over the course of the semester as we have seen many macroeconomic shifts. Despite all these changes, we're fully confident that the portfolio we're presenting to you today is well positioned to succeed, not only for the rest of this year, but also no matter what happens in 2016. As we are speaking to both industry professionals and family members in the audience today, we are going to explain our entire investment process from beginning to end. We are also going to incorporate many of our holdings as illustrations to represent how we've constructed our portfolio for success. From the moment we stepped into CAFE, we took on the role of analysts. We understood that there are different obligations that come with this program than there are in a normal classroom setting. We understood that we had a fiduciary responsibility to our client as money managers. In this case, that was Doc. The most important aspect of this class is to understand and learn every aspect of our top-down analysis approach. From day one, Doc teaches that his main goal is not to teach students, but to train analysts. Whereas in a traditional investments class, students are expected to simply pick successful stocks, student fund managers in the cafe are required to wear many different hats. During the first stage of our top-down analysis, we took on the role of economists. We used global and domestic economic indicators to try to forecast the direction of the economies. We thought that these indicators were the best way to find a hint for where the market would go. After this, we put on the hats of financial analysts, where we then analyzed both sectors and industries to determine what types of companies are driving the market. Lastly, we examined individual firms. To do this, we used key fundamentals, financial statements, behavioral news, and technical indicators. All of these factors helped us determine whether or not a company was worth holding in our funds. As you can see, as financial analysts, we take on a diverse skill set in order to utilize all of the disciplines taught in the Gabelli School of Business. These include accounting, management, international business, and marketing. And when you have to get up and present a fund that's underperformed the market for the year, it's definitely going to take some marketing skills. <laughs> <laughs> now I'd like to invite up Shannon, Brian, and Jonah to talk about the economic analysis. Thanks, Dave. Now there are two main ways to begin an analysis for a portfolio, top down and bottom up. Here in the cafe, we use the top-down approach as we believe it provides better context during stock selection, leading to better company picks and greater returns. To begin our top-down approach, we performed an economic analysis on a global scale to determine if an investment opportunity lies abroad. Focusing most heavily on areas such as China, Japan, and the European Union, we found that many of their key economic indicators led us to an inconclusive decision on their future <coughs> outlooks. Honing in on Asian markets, we will first look at China. China boasts an incredible growth rate of 7% a metric that any developed nation would absolutely want. I mean, how could we possibly ignore them? Not only that, they are an integral part of any nation's economy, as they are a global leader in imports and exports. Well, Jonah, on the other hand, we must consider that China's GDP growth has been decreasing year over year since 2010, from 10.6% to 7.4%. Additionally, we must consider the devaluation of their yuan. Now, there hasn't been an economic event that affected the global markets with such magnitude since 2008. That's right, Brian. Along with that, imports and exports in China has, have also been decreasing year over year. All of this bearish evidence has led us to believe that China is headed in the wrong direction despite being a global leader in growth. Headed east toward Japan, we see a new set of bullish and bearish indicators. Quantitative easing in the country has done wonders for their stock market. 
Not only that, exports have also been in increasing since 2009. While that may be true, Shannon, we also must consider that Japan has been experiencing a recession as indicated by their decreasing GDP year over year. Not only that, while Japan has recently had positive inflation, their previous bouts with deflation were seriously concerning. Then looking from a more unsystematic or behavioral standpoint, Japan seems to be frequently shaken up by natural disasters. As you can see, while Japan had some bullish indicators, there is still far too much risk associated with the country. Now moving west to Europe, Mario Draghi and the European Central Bank have been keeping the economy afloat. With the promise of flexible and aggressive quantitative easing, their dedication to monetary policy was seen as a strong bullish signal. Unemployment in Europe has also been decreasing, although it still remains quite high at 11%. The biggest concern going into the start of, start of the semester was Greek default. With Greek default, all major economies, specifically European ones, would be affected. Also, consumer confidence in Europe, while trending upward, is still below pre-2008 levels. Another thing we considered was the recent influx of Syrian refugees into a variety of the European nations. Economies such as Germany's and various others are going to face a hurdle during our time horizon that will affect them negatively. With all of this in mind, we decided to keep our fund domestic. Now looking domestically, you'll see on the slide behind me a list of bullish trending indicators. We noted a strong dollar and the Federal Reserve's promise to raise interest rates in 2015 as signs of clear economic strength. Now we also consider that certain economic indicators are trending bearishly, such as CPI and industrial production. In a global context, we found ourselves being bullish on the U.S. after our first analysis on September 2nd. While we originally believed that, that the U.S. economy was performing well, Jenny Allen's reluctance to raise interest rates had really shaken our confidence. Investors around the country were similarly discouraged, and because of this volatility, we, saw, we decided to revisit our economic analysis before our October 7th reallocation. Revisiting certain metrics, like unemployment, we realized that they were not as strong as we originally believed. Looking at unemployment in the context of labor force participation and discouraged workers, we noticed bearish trends. Not only that, headline CPI, a significant factor in the Federal Reserve's decision to raise interest rates, was far below their target level. With all this evidence in mind, we updated our outlook to neutral, and as you will see later in this presentation, have prepared a portfolio to succeed not only during economic contraction, but also during expansion. Now that we've completed our economic analysis, I'd like to invite up Jake, Megan, and Kelly to discuss sector and industry analysis. Thank you, Brian. Following our economic analysis, we then moved to the second step of our top-down approach, where we analyze both sectors and industries. The importance of this second step is that we're trying to determine which sectors are driving our economy and which specific industries are driving those sectors. Over the course of the semester, we work to construct a defensive portfolio allocating across all 10 sectors to mitigate the risk of un unforeseen variables. We followed a domestic large cap blend portfolio objective in order to create a defensive fund that would do well in all, all market conditions. The uncertainty and instability in foreign markets was the main reason we elected to remain domestic. We noticed that there was one particular company driving both its industry and sector. That company was Disney. Over the course of the year, Disney has grown so much in value that the previous semester's weightings were no longer an appropriate fit for our portfolio. To give you an example, the previous portfolio allocated 24% in consumer discretionary, with nearly half that being Disney, versus the 14% we hold in discretionary today. We decided not to deviate as much from the S&P 500 market weightings as compared to the inherited portfolio. To determine the appropriate weightings for our fund, we analyzed both sector and industry. Using S&P 500 weightings as our benchmark, we decided to overweight, underweight, or market weight the sectors. We elected to overweight both the technology and the financial sector, given current macroeconomic conditions, as well as our prospective growth rates heading into 2016. We elected to underweight the utilities, the energy, and the healthcare sector, as there are a number of behavioral headwinds for multiple industries within those sectors heading into 2016. Also, most analysts expect those three sectors to underperform the market going forward. Earlier this year and throughout the summer, former student fund managers elected not to allocate funds into the energy, utilities, or basic materials sectors, as they were underperforming during these respective time periods. What we recognized was that it was extremely important to diversify across all 10 sectors of the S&P in order to create a fund that more consistently outperformed the market. Now, as you can see in the example behind me, on a day when the market was down 38 bips, the three leading sectors on that day were energy, basic materials, and utilities. By adding BP and Holly Frontier to our fund, we had a great hedge, as on days where the market was down, energy was often one of the leading sectors. Next, we decided to overweight the financial sector with Visa, Equifax, the Intercontinental Exchange, 
in Berkshire Hathaway. Given this sector's ability to perform well in a rising interest rate environment, it warranted more attention. The Federal Reserve has waffled on whether or not to raise rates for some time. However, we realize that a rate hike is imminent. We also elected to underweight the healthcare sector, as there are a number of behavioral factors for multiple industries within the sector heading into 2016. Most notably, the biotech industry has become increasingly volatile over the last couple of months, creating more risk-averse sentiment among the student fund managers. Thus, we decided to underweight the healthcare sector and not include any securities from the biotech industry as they just didn't fit our portfolio objective. Instead, we chose companies from safer industries including Cardinal Health, Teva Pharmaceuticals, and Quest Diagnostics. After completing our sector and industry analysis, we focused on company analysis, which consists of fundamental, behavioral, and technical analysis. Fundamental analysis refers to the financial stability and success of a company. This form of analysis comprises approximately two-thirds of our overall selection process. Behavioral analysis is any positive or negative news that may impact the company's stock price and makes up roughly a quarter of our selection process. Lastly, technical analysis comprises of the remaining 10%. Technical analysis refers to researching the most opportune time to buy and sell securities. I would now like to invite up Ryan, Rachel, and Dave to discuss fundamental analysis. Thank you, Megan. The third and final stage of our top-down approach is company analysis. Here, we use three different analysis techniques to figure out which companies will best suit our portfolio's objectives. As Doc teaches, the three segments of fundamental analysis include valuation and risk ratios, efficiency and utilization metrics, and cash flow analysis. The importance of fundamental analysis is that all decisions are based on a company's financial strength, and these metrics convey that strength. We rely so heavily on fundamental analysis because it is the most educated way to discern whether a company is financially stable. You have to look at a company as both a business and as a stock. Just because a stock seems like a good deal does not mean that the business is worth investing in. Similarly, just because a business seems to be running well does not mean that it's the right time to invest. The first step into determining the true value of a company is to look at its earnings. We like to invest in companies that have earnings increasing both year over year and quarter over quarter. Doc emphasizes that trends mean everything. And the interesting thing about trends is that they can be either visual or inferred by outside analysts. For example, we hold Cognizant Technology Solutions, which has demonstrated incredibly consistent earnings growth. Over the past five years, Cognizant has doubled both their revenues and earnings per share, offering impressive growth potential for a large cap company. One of the most useful earnings metric we use is the P to E ratio, which is a company's share price divided by its earnings per share. The P to E ratio is so useful because it allows you to assess value. It allows you to determine how much bang for your buck you'd be getting from investing in a company. Behind me, you'll see the current P.E. of Cardinal Health, which is a current holding, and online retail giant Amazon. Cardinal Health's current P.E. of just below 21, compared to Amazon's current P.E. of about 984. Now, Mr. Malafronte, let's pretend for a second that I'm your investment advisor, and I come to you saying I have two investment options. Both will yield $1 in earnings. Option one requires that you invest $984 to receive that one dollar earnings. Option two only requires that you invest twenty one dollars to get that one dollar back in earnings. Now which one of those sounds better to you? I'd like to believe I'd uh, choose option two. Exactly. <laughs> and that's exactly what you see with Cardinal Health as compared to Amazon. Cardinal, El Cardinal Health also has a forward P of 16.36 meaning that moving forward it will only trade at a lower multiple in relation to its earnings. Now, earnings help us assess returns, but in investing, you always have to account for risk. To do this, we use beta, which is the level of systematic risk a company holds compared to the overall market. Some people say that to, in order to get returns, you need to take a bunch of risks, but we completely disagree. For example, Cardinal Health is a beta of 0.89, which is less than the market average of 1, so it's safer. However, its growth metrics show that it has plenty of room to appreciate. As you can see, Cardinal Health offers impressive growth potential with a, pe with a peg and a G prime that trump both its main competitor and its industry. We believe that strong fundamentals will yield growth in the long run without the anxiety and potential losses that come from, a co that com come from risk. The next stage in our fundamental analysis is profitability and liquidity ratios. <coughs> International Flavors and Fragrances is the perfect example of a fundamentally strong company based on cash management. As you'll see behind me, IFF returns over 11.5% on its assets, 
which is double the industry average. Similarly, IFF also returns over 26.5% on its equity, compared to an industry average that is merely half that. Clearly, IFF uses its resources very effectively to generate profits. However, they also use the resources responsibly. You can see that they have a current ratio of 2.38. That number shows that they can easily handle their short-term liabilities, so they won't be caught in a cash crunch. The third and final stage of fundamental analysis is cash flow analysis. The three major types of cash flows are cash flows from operating, cash flows from investing, and cash flows from financing. Cash flows from operating shows the profitability of the day-to-day -day operations of a firm's major business practices. In that sense, it is the most important cash flow that we analyze because it shows whether a company's business practices are growing or not. Cash flows from investing shows how a company is purchasing and selling its capital assets. Lastly, cash flows from financing shows how a company uses both debt and equity to fund its business. Equifax has the strong cash flows that we look for in a company. Its cash from operating activities has been inc increasing each year since 2010 with consistency quarter over quarter as well. In addition, its cash from operations its cash from operations has been currently growing at a 26.5% rate with no signs of slowing down. I now like to invite up Jake, Kelly, and Nick to discuss our behavioral analysis. Thank you, Rachel. The next analysis technique that we use to determine if a company is a good fit for our portfolio is behavioral analysis. Behavioral analysis is any positive or negative news that impacts a company's stock price and comprises 25% of our total analysis. Because of the amount of news available to us, we have to continuously decipher whether news actually impacts a company's overall value and which news is just there to sway the uneducated investor. Behind me on the board are a few examples of behavioral factors that we have encountered this semester. As Doc has always stated, the key to being a successful analyst is being an educated analyst, one who can determine what news has already been embedded into a stock's price and what's not. For example, there's been a lot of hype around the imminent release of Star Wars The Force Awakens, and we believe that this has already been priced into Disney's earnings. However, many uneducated investors believe that this will still be a huge plus for Disney's earnings. Now, we recognize that the new Star Wars movie is expected to generate roughly $2 billion in sales over the next 12 months. Now, considering Disney is expected to earn $52 billion in revenue in 2015 alone, the new Star Wars movie will only count for less than 4% of their total revenues. Another example of the uneducated investor being swayed by behavioral news is Visa's recent acquisition of Visa Europe. When the company announced the acquisition on November 2nd, Visa's stock price dropped 3% that day, as investors took the news of Visa acquiring the less efficient Visa Europe as a negative for the company. However, we recognize this as a positive for the company, as this acquisition was expected to add millions of card accounts to Visa's already impressive portfolio. Therefore, we elected not to sell Visa and held the company through its initial sell-off. Now let me tell you, this volatility was a scary time for us as we couldn't be certain of Visa's outcome. Our patience was rewarded as on the next day, Visa's stock price rebounded 3.5% back to its prior trend channel. Insider buying and selling is another behavioral factor that influences our portfolio on a daily basis. The SEC requires that all insider transactions may be made public and investors can use this information to get an insider's perspective on the company. One example of insider buying that we've seen this semester is by the well-known tech juggernaut, Apple. On August 24th, Apple CEO Tim Cook purchased roughly $46 million worth of Apple share. He wanted to reassure investors that Apple's stock price was a huge bargain. Investors recognized this act of confidence by the CEO and began to pile back into the company over the next couple of weeks. Another behavioral factor that greatly influenced our portfolio throughout the semester was changes in analyst opinions. Now, one of our top holdings in the technology sector this semester is Checkpoint Software Technologies. After about a month after buying into the stock, it was upgraded by Oppenheimer and Company to an outperform rating with a $95 price target. On that day, the stock moved higher by about a half a percent, even though the S&P 500 fell by 1.4%. And as you can see, Checkpoint had received many positive analyst recommendations prior to November 12th. This just emphasizes the importance of analyzing Wall Street sentiment and trends within analyst recommendations when studying behaviorals. Now having an actively managed portfolio, we recognize that there will be times that we will need to sweep a company based on behavioral factors. A company can have the strongest fundamentals imaginable, 
but if its stock price is continually impacted by behavioral news, it is an educated decision to sweep it for something better. I would now like to call up Brian to join me in discussing modeling. Now, while we use various financial programs in the, in the cafe, we also spend a lot of time this semester constructing models of our own to evaluate companies further. Now, we use these models to confirm our initial decision to hold companies. To complement our research using Bloomberg and Quote Equity Plus, we use Microsoft Excel to construct these models. We then use these models to verify what current holdings still have growth opportunity and which ones we should sell off. We constructed a discounted free cash flow model. This model tells us if a company is over or undervalued with respect to its underlying cash flows. We incorporated a variety of factors into this model, including EPS growth, return on equity, and the weighted average cost of capital. The weighted average cost of capital, or WAC, is computed by summing the weights of debt, preferred equity, and common equity, multiplied by their respective costs. WAC acts as the discount rate for discounting 10 years of forecasted free cash flows back to the present. It is pivotal that we confirm that all inputs to this model are correct, as a small change in WAC can cause a large fluctuation in the company's overall value. At the corporate value, less total debt yields the intrinsic value of common equity. In summary, we compare the intrinsic value per share to the current price per share. Now behind me are a few examples of companies we hold that our model confirms are undervalued and have significant room to the upside. For example, Apple, Cardinal Health, and Estee Lauder. We also incorporated a factor into our model that takes into account a 1, 2, and 3% increase in WAC. As you can see, even with a 1, 2, and 3% increase, all three companies still show incredible room to the upside. And we hope that our model holds true in this regard. I would now like to invite up Megan and Ryan to join Brian in discussing portfolio construction. Thanks, Nick. While constructing our portfolio, the three key approaches we used were stock valuation, portfolio correlation, and weighting strategy. Each of these played its own unique role in ensuring the strength of our portfolio against its competitors. Now, in stock valuation, we examine the underlying fundamentals of each potential holding. In portfolio correlation, we examine the directional movement of each of these picks with and against each other. And in weighting strategy, we use a number of factors to determine proper sector weights. It was important that we analyze the fundamentals of each of these companies to make sure that our portfolio weighted statistics fell in line with our growth objective. We sought out companies with a high G prime, and what that means is that the company has a maximum growth potential. Our portfolio weighted trailing PE of just over 22 and our portfolio forward PE of 16.86 ensure that our fund is trading at a low multiple in relation to its earnings. Another important metric that we looked at was the peg ratio. The peg ratio is calculated by taking a company's PE and dividing it by its expected growth rate. Our portfolio weighted peg ratio of 1.75 aligns with our goal of finding companies that have growth persistence. After researching each company and pitching it to the group, we made a list of what we would like to hold in each sector. As you can see from the correlation matrix behind me, the next step was to measure how each stock moved in, with and against each other. In addition, the scales of red to green measure positive and negative correlation, respectively. Now, without proper diversification, an all-green portfolio on one day could easily turn into an all-red portfolio on another, increasing volatility and exposure to losses. Now, through the correlation process, we're able to diversify our portfolio in a way that reaches a target of 60 to 70 percent positive price movement during any given day in the market. We also utilize Markowitz portfolio theory to construct a minimum variance portfolio by spreading our fund across 20 to 25 assets in at least 18 industries and across 8 to 10 sectors. By doing so, we were able to decrease our risk and increase our gains. Through further analysis of our portfolio, we learned that we are not properly diversified against markets' potential losses. As a result, we are reallocated into energy and basic materials to protect ourselves on the down days. For example, we added weight to the energy sector by adding Holly Frontier Corp and by sweeping our energy holding Valero for the more sector correlated BP. <laughs> now this reallocation has effectively lowered our weekly standard deviation and fund volatility throughout the semester. The combination of sector correlation and diversification became even more prominent during this time as we look to hedge our losses and increase our alpha. Behind me, you'll ultimately see the sector weightings that we decided upon. After figuring out our sector weightings, we then decided on each company. For example, in the industrial sector, we currently hold Nielsen Holdings Inc., Raytheon, and the Toro Company. In consumer staples, we hold CVS and Estee Lauder. And at the bottom of the screen, you will see our diversification into the basic materials and utility sector, where we hold International Flavors and Fragrances and WEC Energy Group. 
At this time, I would like to invite up Shannon, Rachel, and Nick to discuss our portfolio performance. Thank you, Ryan. We are going to discuss our performance in two frameworks. First, from the standpoint of time, meaning year to date and since reallocation, and secondly, on both a raw and risk-adjusted basis. Displayed on the screen behind me is an intraday graph of the S&P 500 from August 20th through August 27th. You can see the market contracting going into the close of August 21st, falling nearly 4.5% in, in the previous few trading days. On the morning of Monday, August 24th, the market opened down an additional 6.5%. Now, at this time, all CAFE bylaws required all holdings in both the growth and value funds to have trailing stop loss orders to mitigate downside risk. Therefore, when the market opened, all of these stops triggered and by 12.30 in the afternoon, the market had rebounded roughly 4.5% from its bottom. Now at this time, all summer student fund managers were in New York City at the New York Stock Exchange. This was problematic as no one was in the cafe to buy back into our positions in a timely manner. Thus, we were sitting on cash as the market was running. The market rebounded nearly 7% from its floor by the end of the week. Regrettably, these few days taught us that improper diversification and stop losses can really hurt a fund in times of extreme market volatility. Therefore, we now know that it is imperative to have a student fund manager in the cafe at all times to monitor the funds. Although this may be hard to imagine, the events of these few days took our national championship caliber fund to one out of five percent deficit to the market. It brought our alpha from positive five percent to negative two point five percent, and just a few days later, we inherited this fund. That's right, Shannon. As student fund managers, we walked into a very difficult situation in which our preceding economic analysis, sector weighting scheme, and company selection proved pivotal to set up the fund for success going into the third and fourth quarters. Now, as we had mentioned before, this year is a function of two stories. So let us first tell you what our overall year-to-date performance is. As you can see, we have returned 0.23% year-to-date, unfortunately underperforming the S&P 500. Although we were punished for not being well diversified, we were not alone in this situation, as other mutual funds with similar objectives also underperformed the S&P 500 to a similar extent. We wanted to stress how we worked to get our growth fund from where it was when it stopped out to where it is today. Our goal was to create a more defensive portfolio in order to salvage some of our losses. Since reallocation, we have returned 5.5%. In addition, we then compared our performance against mutual funds with similar objectives. When talking about returns, it is important to understand the difference between raw returns and risk-adjusted returns. We use Jensen's Alpha. This metric accounts for the level of risk we've taken on when evaluating our returns. Our holding period alpha is 0.8%, which shows that we outperform the market in terms of the capital asset pricing model predictions. We believe this to be further augmented by our low beta, which reaffirms our goal of creating a portfolio that can succeed in any market environment. By looking for companies with low betas, we've been able to effectively minimize the downside to our portfolio. Our portfolio weighted beta is 0.88, which shows that when the market moves, we do not move as much. Again, this only serves to reaffirm our goal of creating a defensive portfolio. I would now like to invite up Brian, Ryan, and Robbie to talk about the use of technical analysis in our portfolio. Thanks, Shannon. Purchasing and selling securities is a critical step in achieving our portfolio's ideal weightings. Now, one might think that this is an easy process, but it's actually one of the most stressful. Now, I'm sure we've all heard the phrase buy low and sell high. Well, what happens when you're tasked with purchasing an entire portfolio over the span of one week, and in that one week, the market is rallying. What are we supposed to do? Wait for a pullback? Now, what if the market continues to run? Or on the other hand, what if we buy in at the high and witness the market actually encounter a pullback? In either scenario, we do not look all that educated. This is exactly what happened to us during our buy-in week on October 5th. All that we could do was make the most educated decisions based on technical indicators and intraday trading. Technical analysis is the practice of analyzing historic pricing in an effort to capitalize on future market fluctuations. It provides real-time visuals through the use of Quote Equity Plus and Bloomberg for us to see when certain stocks are in both overbought or oversold scenarios. Now, it also allows us to see when stocks near relative levels of support and resistance, which indicate buy or sell opportunities, respectively. An example of a time in which we incorporated technical analysis was through the purchase of Gap, a leader in the retail industry. Now, as you can see, our assigned stochastics are both moving into the oversold territory below the level of support, indicating a great buy opportunity. Our forecasts proved true, as bullish indicators in the stock ran for the next week, yielding our fund a 3% over a 3% gain. Through our active management strategy, we were able to capitalize on the short-term price movement. 
Now on the selling side of things, Skechers USA was one company in which we were able to time our exit particularly well. We initially added Skechers into the fund as an industry leader with increasing upside potential. However, one day we noticed several alarming factors surrounding the stock, which told us to get out of the company and get out fast. One of these alerting factors was decreasing revenues in international markets while the stock steadily grew upward. International markets, which account for 37% of Skechers' total revenue, was decreasing and as the stock was moving in a steady upward trend. Thus, the stock price was growing artificially. After further analysis, we became increasingly anxious about the stock's gain in volatility. And as the company approached its earnings date, you'll see that the stochastics indicator <coughs> moved into the overbought territory, indicating a good time to sell out. Now, we sold out of Skechers on October 15th. On October 22nd, the company released its earnings and immediately plunged 35% because investors realized that the company wasn't nearly, as, it wasn't nearly as strong as they initially believed. Through the use of technical analysis, we were able to preserve our wealth and prevent the loss of more than one-third of our position's value. Now that you've seen the way we use technical analysis in both buying and selling opportunities, I would like to call up Dave, Rachel, and Kelly to discuss with me our lessons learned. Although every student fund manager can tell you that we treat every day in the cafe as a job, we do recognize that the academic component comes from the lessons we've learned throughout the semester. We can stand in front of you and list off every lesson we've learned this semester, but we're going to focus on the ones that directly apply to working in industry. One of our most encouraging lessons we learned this semester was our earnings play on Nike. We learned early on that if we adhere to our top-down strategy and perform our due diligence, we can achieve great success in industry. When analyzing Nike as a potential earnings play, we first began with the macroeconomic background. Global markets were still feeling the effects of China's currency devaluation, which we felt would help boost profit margins, as well as overall guidance moving into 2016. In addition, the company had not missed a fiscal quarter one earnings estimate in over 10 years. By holding Nike through their earnings release, we were able to gain our portfolio a 9% hike. This was great as a confidence booster because early in the semester, we were still fairly inexperienced as investors. But if only every earnings play went so well. One painful lesson we learned was when we tried to play, do an earnings play on MXP semiconductors. This trade taught us that even when the stars seem to be aligned with 100% certainty, the market will still find a way to use you. This company hadn't missed earnings since quarter three of 2011. <laughs> they were also up 18.5% year to date prior to the earnings call. The company boasted increasing cash flows and forecast expected substantial growth out of this company over the next three years. We thought the company would hit their earnings estimates, and we were right. They actually set their company record for profits. They went up 1% after hours, and we thought we had nailed the earnings play. Except then the next day, we were listening to their CEO's earnings call, and he started to rip lower management. He also said he had no idea where their revenues were going to come from next year. Not surprisingly, investors didn't think too highly of that, and they started panic selling in Europe. By the time our markets even open, they were down 17% and we stopped out to cut our losses. This just goes to show you can never be too confident because the market can always backfire. Another important lesson we learned this semester is that timing is everything. After deciding what assets to allocate into our fund, buying in required a large amount of technical analysis. One stock we were particularly bullish on, Comfort Systems USA, unfortunately didn't make it into our fund due to technicals that didn't align. As we waited for cash to clear in our account, our account, Comfort Systems USA ran to its 52 week high. So we felt that we had missed our buy in opportunity. Thus, we had to quickly go back to the drawing board and find another industrial pick that would yield our fund substantial growth. Comfort Systems would have made a valuable addition to our portfolio. However, the lesson that we learned is you can't chase the perfect stock if it's not the perfect time. Aside from the financial lessons learned this semester, we also learned some valuable life lessons. <laughs> Doc made it very clear on the first day that this should not be treated as a class, but a job. In that sense, we were thrust into an environment where we would have to use both teamwork and time management to meet a substantial amount of hard deadlines. When you have the privilege of managing real money, there's different expectations that go along with that than a normal classroom. For example, every morning when the markets open, we had a report due at 4 a.m. That was about foreign markets and commodities. We have to stay up to date on any news that's relevant to the fund at all hours of the day. With real money on the line, we didn't have time to argue personal differences, but rather we were challenged to utilize those differences for the benefit of our portfolio. And these valuable life lessons and experiences have provided us with the potential to travel abroad and present our portfolio in a professional setting. I would now like to invite up Jonah and Nick to assist Dave in discussing our forecasted performance. 
Thank you, Kelly. As we have said, we've had a tremendously difficult time forecasting whether economic or market conditions are going to be moderately bullish or moderately bearish. With this in mind, we do have a fairly neutral outlook for our forecast. I would now like to recall our current holdings and take you through a few examples of companies that will do well in either a bull or bear market. In the possibility of a bear-induced market by an oil supply shock, we have BP PLC, a company directly tied with oil. They also boast an incredible dividend yield of around 7%, which will provide us with some income during bearish environments. War and acts of terrorism are two forms of systematic risk that are extremely hard for investors to prepare against. Fortunately, we hold Raytheon. Given all the turbulence going on in the world nowadays, we felt it was necessary to hold a company with such close ties to the U.S. Defense Department to prepare. Then we have Teva Pharmaceuticals, a generic drugs producer. Generic drugs are considered economically inferior, which means during times of contraction and recession, their demand actually increases. This was made evident by their stock price appreciating during the bottoming out of the S&P 500 in the financial crisis of 2008. Berkshire Hathaway is a massive company with over 60 subsidiaries and minority holdings and many more. This incredible diversification will allow Berkshire Hathaway to perform well in any market environment. Additionally, the company sits on a healthy bed of cash, which will allow it to succeed going forward even if the market takes a turn for the worst. <coughs> so that's the bear case, but now let's try the glass half full. If the market does run, Cognizant Technology Solutions should thrive. They handle the data processing and outsourcing needs for companies in many different sectors. So if the market is running, they are poised to capitalize on that success. Uh, the, in, a bear, in a bull market driven by a, a rise in interest rates, the financial sector will do extremely well. One of our holdings in particular, the Intercontinental Exchange, will succeed in a rising interest rate environment. The Intercontinental Exchange generates a majority of its revenues from futures transactions and over-the-counter market fees both of which are expected to increase in a rising interest rate environment, as can be seen from the period between 2004 and 2008. And in a bullish market, we can have some bullish consumers. So the consumer discretionary sector is going to succeed, and so will cer certain holdings that we have, such as Home Depot and Starbucks. People, consumers, who have more money to spend will look to buy more premium goods, such as more luxury coffee and home improvement products. Realistically, not even the most seasoned analyst can predict the, market, the market's direction accurately 100% of the time. So we feel we've done a great job preparing our fund for whatever conditions may present themselves. And now I'd like to invite back up our associate directors to close out the presentation. All right, you guys have heard it from everyone up here. We can say without a doubt, our portfolio is prepared to successfully perform in whatever environment we encounter over the coming year. We constructed a defensive growth, growth fund to, prote to protect ourselves to the downside without limiting our upside potential. This is a staple of how we do things in the cafe and is what differentiates us from fund management programs and, acad and academic institutions across the nation. While this may be hard to believe, everything you've heard today is just the first step of being a student fund manager. We also require these student fund managers to write four daily reports the 4 a.m., the 10 a.m., the noon, and the market close. These reports include vital information about our holdings and also allow the student fund managers the opportunity to express their opinions to everybody without having everyone in the cafe. To further drive home and emphasize what makes us stand out in the cafe is our work ethic. Now, as many of you former student fund managers and future student fund managers are aware, it is not an easy task managing a quarter of a million dollars every day for four months. They, they did so while being uh, full-time students, and they gave up countless hours um, on their weekends and nights and sleep to work towards bettering our investment fund. Eric is absolutely correct. Other than our stunning good looks, our work <laughs> ethic is truly what makes us stand out. Uh, this, the cafe is also a perfect example of experiential learning that you just cannot get from a normal classroom. At this time, we would like to thank all of us from the cafe. We would like to give a big thank you to Hans Christensen for sponsoring our trip this upcoming spring to Edinburgh, Scotland, and London, England. Uh, so let's get a round of applause. You couldn't be here today. In addition, we would like to thank everyone who donated today or pledged to donate. Um, the cafe advisory board, cafe alumni, Mr. Eric Rollo, um, we would like to thank all of you because this, this sponsorship money is huge for us because 
With, without it, we can't go on these foreign trips. And we're not just going on foreign trips and sightseeing. We're going and presenting to, you know, institutions, and we're going to academic programs. So this is experience that you don't get uh, at most undergraduate programs. So it's huge to us. So another round of applause for all of you guys. <laughs> at this time, we'll call up everyone from the cafe and open the floor to questions and comments that you guys may have. I guess I'll lead off. Uh, first of all, congratulations. I think you guys all did a great job, so uh, pat yourselves on the back. Uh, just a quick question uh, regarding stop losses. Roughly how many uh, companies did you guys stop out of, and out of those, how many were you able to reinstate into the portfolio, if any? In August 24th, we stopped out of every company that we held. The market was down 6%. All of our companies were down over 10%, so they all stopped out. We, uh, I was over the summer, so we bought back into some of them, but we didn't buy back early enough, and we missed about 5% bump that the market came back. That was what happened there. And unfortunately, all of us didn't walk into the room until I think it was August 30th or September 1st. So for the most part, there was no one in there to buy back in, and it really left us in a hole, as mentioned uh, on the presentation. Thank you. Guthrie? Kind of piggyback up, well, first of all, congratulations, guys. You guys they all did an incredible job, and we all know, you know, the effort that it takes to get to this point. So hats off to you guys. Um, my question, piggybacking off of him as well, is as your group now, how would you guys have handled buying back into your portfolio after stopping out? I think a big difference that we would have had is just to try to stay vigilant about the fund. We are an actively managed fund here in CAFE, and so we really are reliant on kids being there. During the day when the market's open, two people have to be in CAFE at all times. So when you're in New York, obviously you're not in CAFE, but I think we would keep that active management mindset and just be more vigilant going forward. Not to mention, we all took technical analysis with Doc over the summer. so. You know, that was fresh in our minds in terms of like a great buying opportunity. So we would rely heavily on you know, technical analysis in terms of when is the proper time to buy into those stocks. Thank you. I'm assuming you're here. You heard the New York Stock Exchange is going to stop doing the stock loss. Right? Yes, this yes. Back the flash crashes on it. But have you ever this, uh, thought about uh, stock, uh, stock limits at all? You know, stop limits are also a good mechanism to use in terms of trying to reduce your risk. and. Uh, we will consider those, especially if stop losses are removed. However, the key for us going forward is really to focus on that active management. That way, we're not caught in a situation like we were this August again. And how do you guys, um, you're in domestic equity right now, correct? For the most part, <clears throat> yes. Um, and how many, how many holdings per uh, portfolio do you have? We have 27 uh, funds in our portfolio. Is it usually 27 funds at all it's, it's usually between 20 to 27, depending on how we allocate. Do uh, you guys have a decision maker when you want to go off to emerging markets when you see an opportunity or international markets? Um, no matter what, no matter what trade they make, uh, it has to be approved by I think it's 80 percent of the student fund managers themselves, and it has to be approved by one of me, Zach, or Doc. So uh, if they do want to go into emerging markets, that's fine, like we did with NXP semiconductors. But uh, like we said, there is an order of uh, a pecking order that you have to adhere to. If you had to buy one stock right now, what would it be? Cognizant Technology Solutions. Uh, they're from our top-down approach. They're in the perfect industry for success. The, uh, the IT services industry is fantastic in tech right now. They have great margins, and they're really poised for success going forward. Another possible company that we'd consider would be Intercontinental Exchange. We, we see a lot of benefit for them going forward, uh, especially uh, with the new acquisition of the uh, New York Stock Exchange. Job that mistake. You see those? Yeah. What do you think? Uh, I mean, I think that they're definitely going to positively impact Yellen's decision uh, coming up, but who knows? I mean, truthfully, unemployment's a very interesting factor, uh, especially when people such as Janet Yellen discuss it. Uh, however, when we viewed uh, unemployment, we still notice, even to this day, that labor force participation, marginally attached workers, and discouraged workers, even underemployed workers, are still very, very bearish in terms of trends. So despite seeing positive jobs postings, uh, we still don't see unemployment as 
healthy as it could be. Essentially, we don't think unemployment is as healthy as the U3 rate is showing it is. This year's uh, being stopped out of everything gave you a clean slate to create a portfolio from scratch this year. But typically, do you have any strategy or method to create continuity or consistency from semester to semester and year to year? Or does each team every year cre recreate the wheel? So uh, a lot of the time in our growth fund, we are allowed to change things up frequently. We make trades and different things like that. It's a, a more of the learning aspect of it. However, in our value fund, which is the other fund that we operate, that is more of a buy and hold approach. So we consider reallocation every semester in that, but that fund tends to have much more continuity than this one. Were both funds stopped out though? Both yep. funds stopped out. Both funds uh, were required to have at least a 10% stop on everything, and for the most part, 95% of our funds stopped out. Hey, um, Dan Sherwood, 2012 uh, Cafe Kid. Um, just from personal experience, and I remember we went through the exact same thing we went through, the, you know, the European fiasco, and I think we all, you know, we have a fiduciary responsibility at Cafe, but when we also think about, you know, this is one investment of our life. We also think about all these other investments we're doing. Uh, be interested in like a show of hands on in your personal portfolios. How many of you? Because your you know, your, your timeline is totally different. How many of you would even have stop losses? Would any of you? Um, I would say since you know the advent of technology, being able to just do it on your phone, you know, manage money on your phone, it's very easy to you know check it every hour when you get out of class. So for the most part, I would say that stop losses are kind of a dying breed, especially after all of us have been snake bitten by them, uh, after walking into the environment we did. So, for the most part, I would say stop losses, as the New York Stock Exchange is proposing, are going to be gone. Did you guys uh, experience any times when you stopped out of something, or you had a, a stock go down greatly and you analyzed that, hey, this is even a better time to buy and double down? Someone else? <laughs> All right, so we typically, uh, we this semester we've, you know, whenever you see something fall by a drastic amount, you want to figure out the root causes of it. Is this an anomaly? Is this something we would be overreacting to and panic selling? Or is there something fundamentally that's changed about this company? So we evaluate it on a case-by-case -case basis. And just so, taking a look, uh, just for an example, uh, Nike this semester, which we talked about, we held for an earnings play. Uh, you know, we sold out and took our gains there. And then uh, retail sales data came out and consumer discretionary and retail companies as a whole um, went downward and we ended up purchasing Nike again for short term uh, later in the semester. I agree, it's an exceedingly good, good looking group. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you guys worked very, very hard. Congratulations on all that. Thank um, you very much. Something that you guys enjoy, that you had fun doing. Yeah. And up to the whole group. Someone else can talk. Personally, I really had fun on the day. It was the uh, Fed meeting in September when we were all betting on whether Janet Yellen would choose to raise interest rates or not. And we had all of the monitors going in the classroom and we were watching everything so intense. But everyone was in there and working and I thought it was really fun. Personally, I really enjoyed um, going through the selection of choosing companies. Me and uh, Dave are the tech sector analysts. and looking for value companies when everything is run up to its 52 week high was a little difficult but the challenge was really a lot of fun for us um, we were able to sift through pretty much every company so now I can say I have a really good grasp on the tech sector. Sorry, I have more. So you guys did a great job but um, what's your views uh, on the energy sector right now with the oil prices going you know, on today's action as well as the interest rates so those two. Yeah, so we found energy to be an extremely important hedge for our portfolio this semester. Prior semesters hadn't allocated any capital towards the energy sector, um, but again, we found that when days when the market was down, usually energy would be one of the sectors that was leading. Um, so again, it was important to diversify into energy. And then from an interest rate perspective, I mean, just yesterday, Janet Yellen uh, and the uh, Federal Reserve were giving strong indications for an interest rate hike coming in very soon, even in December. However, uh, a lot of the things that they cited, the two things they cited in September, for example, uh, headline, or in their, uh, in their case, headline PCE and uh, global markets were, are still not at the level that they like. Along with that, labor force slack is still there. So while many economists feel that an interest rate hike may be coming in December, 
uh, I think a lot of the group is still fairly bearish on that and believe it could be later. Also to touch on that, as you know, probably the, the strong dollar is inversely correlated with the price of oil, so an interest rate hike should strengthen our dollar even more. So we may have to reevaluate our reevaluate our BP holding and get out in case the oil plummets even further. Um, going back to interest rates, Janet Yellen has, has also emphasized um, not the timing of interest rates, but the pace at which at which she um, delegates them. So we're also fairly neutral. Questions? Sorry, one it's more. okay. Let's <laughs> go okay. right ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Would you guys ever buy um, a newly listed company after its IPO? Why or why not? I would say as a rule of thumb, we don't really buy companies if unless they've IPO'd after four years. Um, for us, it's just a little too risky for our growth portfolio or for our blend portfolio. We try to remain a little more uh, we on the safer side. Um, so anything that has IPO'd in the past four years, we'd probably veer away from. Also, if you're just looking at the past six months, um, it, IPOs, for the most part, have been fairly unsuccessful. So it's, it would be a pretty volatile move and r risky move on our part to invest in any of them. Thank you. How much gold do you buy percentage of your portfolio? Um, we, don't, we don't have any gold in our portfolio. We did consider it as a hedge, but has been kind of hammered down recently, so we currently don't hold any. Keep going. Go you stop. <laughs> yeah. So there was a group here that analyzed the financials. Um, there are no banks or insurance companies in their portfolio. Yes. Um, we actually initially, when we selected companies, did hold a bank, uh, People's United Bank, um, and we were able to realize a 6% gain on this. However, uh, due to the Fed continuously po pushing off the interest rate hike, um, banks in particular have been really hammered down uh, this year so far. So because of just our uncertainty over when uh, Janet Yellen will raise rates, we've elected to stay away from them for the time being. And with regards to the insurance industry, they've been hammered. Um, so, <laughs> so in terms of like the, our growth objective, we didn't really foresee growth within the next few months. In, in addition, uh, we didn't hold any big banks due to some concerns about the TLAC uh, requirements that are come out. And also, I'm sure a lot of you know, the Federal Reserve just announced that they're no longer the bank of last resort for banks. So we thought that was a lot of risk that they're going to have to adjust their lending and see if they're probably becoming more conservative, I'm assuming, with the lending that they uh, bring give out. How did you guys consider the regulatory Uh, one company we were very optimistic about uh, was Wells Fargo, but like uh, Zach mentioned, with the TLAC requirements, if you tend to rely on riskier lending, you're going to have to pay penalties or uh, increase your tier one lending. And so, as banks adjust to these regulations, we decided to stay out of the fray for a while. So, if you could wave a wand and short a stock, which one would it be? And uh, does your kind of views on insurance? Tempt you to short it or not? Do you imply by our portfolio um, wave a wand? <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I thought you can't short. So I'm saying if you could, if you had the power to short, would you? And and uh, where where do you see opportunities to short if you could? Uh, I mean, I'm sure that we all have different opinions as as to what's the most overvalued thing out there. But um, for example, Weight Watchers after Oprah just said she was going to buy a 10% stake in the company. We know that that isn't actually as viable of a stock, uh, considering it's ran up almost over 150 percent since since yeah since the event. So um, that's one stock I guess we would short. But everyone else has different opinions on uh, certain stocks. If you guys want to weigh in, um, we recognize that the risk profile uh, for shorting is a lot different than the risk pro profile for going long in a stock. It's a lot more risky to short a stock. Um, so even if we had the opportunity to short, we might not, unless we wanted to reduce our overall net exposure to the market. Um, but in that case, we might just move more to cash than, than go short. One more. So, sorry. Um, in regards, so I know we talked a lot about the portfolio, but I think one of the other key aspects from the cafe is around leadership and being able to build relationships and figure out who you can and cannot work with. So could you guys give some instances on where you may have had cafe tips and kind of how you guys worked through it together as a group and resolved what's maybe what stock to buy and kind of how that brought you better to kind of get 
get ready for the industry because you're not always going to get along with your coworker. I think this was a great experience for all of us because I can definitely say uh, there are some big egos in the room, uh, mine being one of them. Uh, <laughs> We all were pretty uh, highly achieving students as part of the requirements for being in the program and everybody has their opinions and wants to get their two cents in, but I think we all learned to work together as a unit and we were a lot more cohesive by the end. You definitely, you know, we always say that we treat each other like family, so there's a good side of that and that we all like each other and also we're willing to argue with each other when it's time to do that. So it was a great learning experience from that angle. Um, just the pure amount of time that we spend together, I mean, we're forced to be together all the time all the time, every day. We're forced to spend uh, overnights with each other. Uh, we really spent that time trying to figure out our differences and work to better the fun instead of personal differences. Well, that seems like a really good place to conclude the question and answer period. <laughs> so I, I hope you'll join me um, in giving a round of applause, not just to the students up here, but to their advisor and mentor, Dr. Michael Melton. Let's give them a to acknowledge um, a few people who have been very, very supportive of the CAFE program from the standpoint of our uh, trying to raise additional resources. And Eric already mentioned Hans Christensen, um, who has been a great supporter. Unfortunately, he could not be with us here today. I'd also <laughs> like to recognize David Castano, who is an uh, alumnus of Roger Williams University and with Bank, uh, Bank of America, who could not be with us. And Deborah Stokes, an alumnae of Roger Williams University, who also was a big supporter of the cafe and who unfortunately also could not be with us today. But I would like to recognize all of those three people as being incredible supporters of this, uh, of this activity for the students and for all of the things that they try to do and accomplish in their work in the cafe. And I'd like to just kind of um, take off on that. Okay, well, it's a them. take this opportunity to make a very special announcement, um, which we made to uh, the alumni earlier today at lunch, but I'd like to make it to all of you while you're in this room. We are announcing today the launch of the, ca the campaign for the cafe. And this campaign has three component parts to it. One component part is the alumni initiative where we ask the alumni at lunch to provide some support for student travel. Uh, the students take two trips a year outside of the United States to present their portfolios and their research methodologies. And these trips require support and we've asked the alumni to, to gather together and to help support this effort through a crowdsourcing hubbub uh, activity that's going to open in January on the 15th. There are two other components to the campaign for the cafe. One is the major gifts component and one is the corporate support component. And we already have uh, three major uh, gifts under the, under the major gifts portion of the campaign from the people who I just mentioned. We are uh, building relationships with organizations, companies to help support the cafe as well. And there's information about this new campaign for cafe in the folders that you were given when you arrived today. And so we hope that you will look at that information and consider the possibility of supporting the cafe in some way, a small or large. Um, any and all support is very gratefully accepted and welcomed and appreciated. So I'd also like to um, invite all of you, um, parents, friends, alumni, to join us and stay with us for the reception that will should be set up right outside. We can continue the questions and answers there. I hope to have a chance especially to meet all the parents who are here today and I want to extend a special thank you and welcome to you and to our corporate friends that have taken the time and trouble to join us today as well. So thank you so much for being here. We hope to see everybody back in May um, for another great presentation. But you guys did a wonderful job. Thank you again.